Great defeaters, new and old, welcome back to a little delayed episode of The Breakdown with your host, Base the Kid, Tony, the pugilist boy. We are the children of the game. Tony, how are you doing? I'm doing very well, very relaxed on this bank holiday Monday. Indeed, right. So people, as you kind of can tell right now, uh, we've pre-recorded this one because there was nothing to talk about this week in terms of boxing that we feel you would probably really want to interact with. So you can kind of consume this as and when you please. Um, we didn't get a chance to do last week's one, um, some last minute timings with the team. Um, so what we're going to do is we're basically going to do last week, talk about the one fight of any interest this week. Um Keep it moving, and then we'll be looking forward to uh, the weekend's action coming up. Obviously, we won't speak on that here, but you know, we'll we'll just maybe highlight that, and then we'll be back next week as normal. So, I guess without further ado, Tony, if you're um, you know, if you're happy to sort of just go straight into it, um, I want you to start off with uh, Rakimov and Cordina, and then I'll follow suit. Okay, so it was a Hefty fight card uh, over at Cardiff on the previous weekend, headlined by Joe Cordina, going to reclaim his world title against Rakimov. And what a fight. Without shadow of a doubt, it was a contender for uh, fight of the year. Joe going for his IBS world super featherweight title. Um I think I heard you mention a little bit uh, in your sort of uh, preamble about before the fight began about both fighters being really um, stripped down in terms of their their weight, them both looking quite gaunt on the scales. I thought the same myself. Um, But although they appeared to be um, very stripped down for the weighing, when the fight time came, the action came fast and furious and there was no let up in what they did by way of performance. It was a toe-to-toe battle royale for 12 rounds. Um, One which saw, as you can see from the picture, um, a beautiful left hook from Joe, which caught uh, Rakimov flush in the second round and dropped him. But this was very much an ebb and flow type battle which saw ascendancy for both fighters. And by the end of the fight, I would definitely say there was reason to to see that there could have been a potential split decision. If if not a win for Rakimov, then potentially at least a draw. Now, I actually saw Joe Cordina winning this fight, but I saw it very close. I think I gave it to him by a round or two at max. Joe was very sharp. As you can see, he managed to do quite a bit of uh, facial damage to uh, wreck him off with his combinations. And, um, you know, he was able to pick some very beautiful shots as he does. In it, you know, coming from his southpaw stance, he's very slick. He works really well in the pocket. And, you know... He, he maintains distance. I mean, you know, I like to talk about distance control to the youngsters um, in my gym. And when the, the, the morning came after this fight, you know, I was saying to my kids, you know, go look at the fight from last night with Joe Cordina because he shows great footwork to get in and out of trouble, but he also shows great distance control. But don't let this get you as thinking that this was a one-way battle because Rakimov, to his credit, fought with great intention and sustained his attacks in a very managed way, which meant that when he came in to offload his shots, he very often caught um, caught Joe Cordina with several shots uh, in a a flurry very quickly. Um, His battle is all about going in, doing... Um, you know, uh, a five, six, seven punch combination and coming out. 
So when Joe decides he's not going to work as hard, Rakimov would wrap, wrap up around just surely, but purely on work rate alone. Um, so most of the rounds that Rakimov wins, he doesn't win them with devastating punches. He wins them by volume of punches and the fact that he's outworking Joe by a significant margin in that round because Joe gets his punches in. He's going to show you something flash in most rounds, but the rounds that I scored to rack him off, he, he clearly wins them because he just works that much harder. Now, um, there are a certain number of swing rounds in the fight. I can't tell you off the top of my head because it's so far removed from, from the fight itself, but the reason that I, I could see why you could see that this fight would possibly be considered uh, a draw, which was, you know, in the back of my mind, I was thinking, ooh, has he made a mistake in trying to coast in that 12th round? Because the 12th round was pivotal to me. Joe coasted the whole round. He's running around the ring, showed that, you know, um, showing, you know, raising his hands, getting involved with the crowd. And he's like, I've got this one. And I'm like, you haven't got this one to be able to dance around the ring. If I was in his corner, I'd be telling him that you need to come out and win this final round to ensure that you don't leave it to chance. But he didn't. He left it to chance. And guess what he did? He won around the ring. And then he walked into a combination from Rakimov. I was like, what have you just done? You think you're winning, but if there's any chance that this round is the deciding round, you've lost it because you walked into a flurry and you didn't throw any punches. He literally ran around the ring, walked into range and just let Rakimov hit him. Rakimov knew, you know what? You come in there near me, I'm just going to let loose. And it was like, Joe, you needed to fire off and win that round, but you didn't. And that round to me was the round where he could potentially have lost this fight or at least drawn the fight. Um, but let me say, after all that, I still think I just had him by shading it around maybe even, you know, two rounds um, because his, his work was... Uh, more effective when he won his rounds in terms of, you know, you could see he was definitely hurting Rakimov with some of the shots. Obviously, the 10-8 round in the second, um, you know, had it not been for that 10-8, this fight could have been a whole different story. So that's my opinion on the fight. Well, you know what? Um, okay, so for one quick thing. You said or something about someone in the southpaw stance. Who was you referring to? Um... I'm talking, was it not Joe Cordina? No, Rakimov was a southpaw. It's, it's Rakimov, sorry. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay, cool. No, I'm uh, just trying to clarify that purely because, yeah, you're right. The knockdown is basically what won Cordina the fight. If he didn't knock him down, the fight would have actually gone to a split decision draw because one of the judges had it six rounds apiece but it was 14-13 to Cordina just because of, obviously, the knockdown. So, yeah, um, I agree with you. The 12th round, I mean, I think one of the judges had him winning that. Possibly both of them, but funny enough, when I was watching it, I was watching I was, uh, on a watch-along as well, and I remember um, two of the guys in the watch-along see him running around the ring, and they're like, this isn't as close as you, this isn't as wide as you think it is. And they literally said, you know, what? I hope he loses because of that. <laughs> Just <laughs> because it's like, you haven't, you haven't secured the bag. You haven't, you know, basically stripped the, you haven't stripped the champion of his title. Um, you're, you're acting as if you've won everything. This is a lot closer than you think because you've, you know, your gas tank has not let you down, but like, obviously this is his game. He goes hundred miles an hour round in round out and you have to be able to either match that or hurt him enough that he can't do that um mm. which obviously you didn't do past the sixth round um now yeah no he he started off very fast very sharp um i won't go too much into the technicals but um his movement as i said to before when you look at the fights between rakamov and barrett compared to this one there's just one of them 
is a lot more natural in the movement. Um, one uses a lot of it's almost it looks like twitch fiber energy, but it's all it's more explosive. Every time you move, it's an explosive movement. Whereas the other one is more of a glider. Like they literally just glide around the ring and use less energy because it's a natural it's a natural movement as opposed to like a, a spring, uh, a sprint, a fast sort of like a fast twitch springing movement. So the whole first half of the fight he had controlled with you know better um it was better range um control, better movement, punch selection, punching with mean intentions. But I always felt to myself that Rakimov might get hit and sort of maybe caught cold at the start, but he'll be okay. Not because Joe isn't a big puncher. I believe that he's he's developed a punching power that he probably didn't have before. But I was always worried about would he really throw that right hand as the, at the velocity it needs to go to take down Rakimov, based on obviously the very bad break he had in he had in the in his um you know, in the hand itself. So all of that said to me, right, this has to kind of go points. Now, obviously, first couple of rounds, you see what happens, but I'm like, okay, I'm not going to view this in, um, I guess, rose-tinted glasses because I've seen Rakimov drop before. He gets up and it's like, unless you can fully get him out of there in that moment, he will recover. And his powers of recovery are there to there to see. Um but yeah, it was a, it was an ebb and flow fight um, all throughout. As I you know said previously, while I can never agree with the nine three card that Rakimov got from one of the judges, um, I can definitely see a scenario where you could give him seven rounds or or six. So a one fourteen one thirteen to him wouldn't have been a crazy scorecard based on some of the activity, and then. Likewise, a 115-112 to Cordina or a 114-113, which is a draw plus the you know, plus the knockdown, which is ultimately what won it. Because if it wasn't for that knockdown, as I said, Cordina would, you know, it would be a draw and they'd either have to run it back again, or Rakimov would be in the clear to go about his business because he's defended the title, he's given up the rematch he needed. Um so yeah, it was a as you said, it was definitely fight of the year contender. Um We've had some good ones this year, but that one action packed is what we like. Um, you know, Joe Cordina getting badly, badly hurt in the fifth round from a, a springboard. It was almost like a spring uh, springboard jab um, that he caught. It was like a it's like a short hook, but the trajectory came almost just like a jab. But yeah, it rocked Cordina to his boots and he had to survive. But that's what the champions do. They come through a crisis, they manage it, and then they come out the other side and, you know, do what they need to do to win, um, which we might end up having to segue into a little later on in the show. But um, <laughs> yeah, look, I'm I'm more than happy to to sort of leave that one there. Like, congrats to Cordino, two time IBF super featherweight champion, undefeated, and has beaten two reigning champions to win the belt both times. No vacant titles. Got to commend him for that. Um, yeah, it would be interesting to see what happens moving forward for both guys. I don't just want to throw Shavkat Rakimov away. He's definitely going to be in big fights again moving forward. And if I was him, I'd maybe try and test one of the other champions. Maybe have a chat with uh, a Navarrete or or like Hector Luis Garcia and see if I can maybe make a play for one of their belts. Because it's um you know it's I definitely don't think it's the end for him. Mm. If he moves up, that might actually even be better for him. Quite frankly. Based on just how how gaunt he looked, I think he might do a lot better at 135. You know, I think because remember, let's not forget, Joe Cordina was at 135 as well. He went, he moved back down to 130. So there's yeah. no reason, there's absolutely no reason to say that. Looking how Shavkat Rakimov looked, that he can't not be a nice natural 135. -er. And the yeah. biggest guys are gonna are gonna bounce. Um, Haney's going soon. Ta um, Ryan Garcia's already gone so you just got Tank Shakur uh, obviously those two there are a problem but Williams are paid out against Shavkat Rakimov you told me you don't want to see that fight two yeah, south no, pressure they, fighters I mean, going at it and that's a decent fight but there's, you know you're forgetting some of the other killers in that way, that division well the thing is if you look at it there's them look you got he can go in against someone like Michelle Rivera 
Frank Martin, like mm. Isaac Cruz, like all of these guys. Frank Martin's dangerous, bro. They're all dangerous, but at the end yeah, of the day, I'm, I'm just saying at one three five. If I can stay at 130, I'll stay clear of that 135 division because it's got some bad cats in it. But, I like but 130's bad. got serious, bad cats. What, 130's it, got very bad cats as well. Yeah, true, but you know what? If you can, you know, just if you can stay there, stay there. You know, look, as you said, there's plenty, there's plenty work in that 130 division for him to make decent money. Um, you know, and, and perhaps come back and get another title and, and do unification somewhere along the line. So, you know, but 135, <laughs> that division is to me possibly the best division in, in, in boxing right now. But bear this in mind, and um, this obviously isn't a knock on anyone that's there, but Devin is going to is gonna move up, right? I reckon mm. win, lose or draw, he'll move up unless they offer him the big, big bag against tank right yeah now with that being said if he beats loma and he moves up all the belts get scattered you telling me shavkat rakimov can't pick up a vacant title against someone else he can and then yeah. just he can put he can parade that title until shakur mm. comes through yeah because <laughs> ultimately everyone in that division is on borrowed time until shakur comes to belt collects it's that simple yeah 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 but, um I reckon I just reckon it might be a better weight for him overall because he won't have to deplete himself down. And maybe those early rounds that he takes where he gets caught flush early and, and drops, maybe the resistance comes because he doesn't have as much he's got more sort of fluid and, and body at the time. But hey, yeah, it's all speculation. All right, yeah. let's let's move on anyway. Um so I guess moving on from there, we can I guess talk quickly about um Lucas Rosansky. Now, let's do the undercard real quick. I just want right, to give a, a, a couple of shout-outs. Um, Zelfa Barrett against Jason Sanchez. A very good performance by Zelfa Barrett. Obviously, Jason Sanchez, hard as hell, um, you know, uh, coming off his previous um, fight with uh, Rakimov. You know, this was a very entertaining fight again. Um, you know, look, I, I've got a lot of time for Zelfa Barrett. Um you know, Pat Barrett as well, uh, a guy who, you know, I grew up, um, you know, boxing around the same time as Pat. But I just thought this was a very assured performance. Um, you know, um, Jason Sanchez, despite getting rocked um, in the fifth round, he was able to stand up and, and keep himself in this fight and cause havoc for, for Zelfer at certain points. But Zelfa was very composed. You could see he's learned a lot from the Rakamov fight, um, you know, that he could come back to this kind of situation and when in need, you know, turn it on and do what was necessary to win the fight. The other fight that I thought was very interesting was Jordan Thompson against Luke Watkins at Cruiserweight. Jordan Thompson, 14-0 against 16-2 Luke Watkins. Again, um... Jordan Thompson looks like he's going to be a, a, a real problem in the cruiserweight division. He comes out, he looks very assured. He's throwing some haymakers at Luke Watkins. And haymakers, there's kind of like a play on words there because he is kind of very similar looking to David Hay. Um, but again, I want to give Luke Watkins a lot of respect because he didn't just fold. He came back real hard at Jordan Thompson. And I know Eddie was glowing about Jordan Thompson at the end of this fight, but I would be holding back the reins and going, hang on a second, you just got exposed again. Because he got exposed in his last fight, got very lucky. Don't forget, last round, he got he nearly got knocked out in, his, in, in the previous fight to this. Yeah? In this fight, Luke Watkins has him wobbling all over the place. And that's like, hmm, really? But didn't you so, just say you was impressed with him? No, the early rounds and obviously the finish. The oh. finish, he, you know, look, he, he gets through the wobbles. He gets through what, what Luke Watkins has to throw at him and he comes back strong and he does what he has to stop Luke Watkins in the sixth round of this 10-rounder. So I have to give Jordan Thompson credit for his performance because overall, starts well, goes for a rocky period, 
and finishes well. And that shows pedigree. That shows, you know, a man who doesn't quit, as we're about to talk about, you know, when the chips are down. So, good luck to Jordan Thompson going forward. Want to see him in good fights. But obviously, just need to caveat that, you know, this showed a, a few flaws in his game. Also on the undercard, and I'm sure you're going to want to say something, Sandy Ryan against Mir Mary Pierre Hull. Great performance by Sandy. Um, uh, I thought she was going to take out Marie Pierre because at certain points in a fight, she's she's very strong and she's using some very hard punches in against Marie. But, you know, um, Hull is a very strong fighter. She manages to ride. And again, you know, she she, she herself um, is, is a, a, a puncher who's, a, 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 sorry, a boxer who's got very little power in his in her punches but she's able to throw a lot of punches and therefore causes um sandy a few problems in certain rounds but overall very good performance by sandy right you want to say anything on that one um yeah no it was it was a good performance obviously sandy um sometimes needs to f focus on a bit of defense with the offense i know some people say offense is the best defense but she can leave herself open and maybe against heavier hitters probably could get caught a cropper, similar to obviously the Erica Farias first fight, which is why she boxed her more in the rematch. I was very surprised at how big Sandy looked in the ring compared to Marie, who's who's been naturally competing at 147 her entire career. But Sandy looked like, I'm not going to say twice her size because that's a bit of an overstatement, but mm. she looked much bigger than Marie in there, not just height-wise. So, Mm. I'm just wondering how much weight she used to have to lose to get to 140. Because um, she looked, obviously, she always used to look a bit fleshy until the rematch with Farias. But in that fight, she looked a lot more lean. She'd taken her training a lot more seriously. She looked lean. She had like six packs. She was just ripped and defined. And even this one, she was defined, but it's like nowhere near as. So obviously, you, you could tell it's seven pounds. You mentioned, you mentioned 140, but this was a 147 fight. Yeah, I know. What I'm saying is, at 140, I'm wondering how much weight she would have she okay. was losing to get to 140 yeah, yeah, because yeah, yeah. she was shredded in the first one, mm. and then or near shredded. Now this one, obviously, not as much, but was still in very good condition. But she must have hydrated to a mad weight because she looked much much bigger than Marie, yeah. who normally campaigns at 147. So yeah, um, this may actually suit her better overall to to stay up at 147, and we know that the the uh, talent pool obviously gets a little bit more shallow the higher up the weights you go. So provided she, you know, can get through either McCaskill or Hubbard's in, she could be a, a very long time reigning champ at the 147 division with not too many people like challenging. So it's, um yeah, it's interesting. It's just, it was a good performance, but there's obviously still more room for improvement, but I'm sure that Clifton will sort out the, the necessary steps for the for the uh, Jessica McCaskill fight if she does beat Haberzin, uh moving forward. But yeah, congratulations, Sandy Ryan, on being the new WBO uh, welterweight champion because that was for the vacant WBO um, world title. So good job there. there we so go. let's just move on, shall we, to Poland? Yeah, Luca. Yeah, Lucas Rosansky and Alan Babich. Okay, so. I'll talk, I'll talk. I through wasn't this expecting one. a great deal from this card, but it kind of ended up being a very surprising what couple of minutes worth of 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 action. Um, I re I really didn't know too much about Rosansky. In all honesty, I, you know, I just really felt like you know, obviously, Alan Babich has campaigned um, quite a lot at heavyweight. He's gone down to this new bridge weight and he's got his, his chance to do stuff. He's got his compadre Dillian White in the corner. And unfortunately for him, he didn't get past the first round. Rosansky came out on smoke and literally within the first minute and a half had Alan Babich down on the floor. As you can see, he got up from the count, but it was an immediate attack from Rosansky. Alan Babich is just a street fighter. I've got to say, I mean, you know, he has very limited boxing skills. 
And therefore, what what you'd expect from a boxer who's been who's touched down to you know use a bit of um, loaf, as they say sometimes, and maybe circle the ring and you know try and establish a jab. You know, he just didn't have anything to be able to say. Oh, I'm in a bit of trouble. I know what to do. I need to do this, or I need to do that. It looked like it was just like okay, street fighter mode. And he came back again, and Rosansky just tagged him again. And over in one round. Well, what I will say, no, I think the problem in this fight is that he <clears throat> tried to box when it wasn't, this wasn't a boxing type fight. Like, if you look at the, the way that the fight actually starts, he goes out attempting to do a double, uh, a double jab to Rosansky, whereas Rosansky hunks down low. Dips underneath the jab hand and then throws some and throws tight hooks. Now, what he done, he threw the overhand right and the overhand left, but he throws them a lot tighter than what Alan normally does. Alan normally throws a lot more wide, bringing his entire body twisting into the shot, whereas Lucas was a little more compact. Now, I knew that he was that type of fighter because I've I've seen one of his fights before, and that's basically what he does: is he hunkers down low, sort of just gets in, gets in low, and then lets you know lets those hooks go. Um, but yeah, it was the case of Alan decided that he wanted to kind of be, I guess, the boxer puncher as opposed to the you know the pressure and brawler that he's used to, and he was caught in between styles, got caught cold, and then realized that the boxing wasn't going to help him at that precise moment and then wasn't steady enough to be able to initiate his normal game plan because he, he, in that moment he had just met someone that was better at it than he was or at least was a lot neater and tighter with it and was still fresh because he can say what he wants about I didn't feel the shots like you felt the shots because your your body told you that those shots that you felt them whether whether or not they hurt is a lot different to you not because your body reacted a certain way because those shots did what they needed to do. And yeah, it was just, he got caught cold. I don't know if he would have been able to recover. I mean, it was a bit of a, a quick stoppage by the ref to be totally honest, because he was still firing backup points. Um, you know, he wasn't, his, his eyes weren't, you know, glazed in the back of his head at that precise moment. But, it was also a stoppage where it's hard to even argue. Um, or you, if you are arguing, it's kind of futile. futile just like, uh, all right, well, I I think you maybe could have let him go on, but it is what it is, as uh, you like to famously say. And look, we'll see what happens to him moving forward. I mean, is he is he going to get any more fights? Is he going to try and go back to matchroom after obviously saying he feels like Eddie let him down? Is he going to try and stick with Boxer and, you know, join the heavyweight division? Because even though we're saying, oh, he went down to Bridgerweight, he he came in at the same weight he's come in every other fight. <laughs> it's not like he, he lost any weight for the, the... It's the exact same weight. If anything, he yeah, needs to go yeah. down to Cruiser and just fight some smaller people down there. But, <laughs> but yeah, so... We'll see what happens to him moving forward, but for now, you've got Lukas Rosansky. Maybe he can now be the face of Polish boxing and they can have some more events out there rather than having to travel across to all the other different countries to, to get fights. We'll see. Yeah, so interesting, yeah. I think Rosansky is clearly going to be, um, you know, a big name in, in Poland because they do love their boxing. Um, you know, they've had um, varying levels of success in, in the annals of, of history with various boxers and obviously Rosansky is now sort of going to take up the mantle of being the poster boy for Polish boxing and they're very vociferous in Poland about their boxing uh, in fact any Polish boxers who, who travel to the UK or actually are resident here in the UK and they box you can normally expect a very loud and vocal crowd who support their guys <clears throat> A um, couple of fighters worthy of just to mention on the undercard. Michael Sislak uh, scored a fourth round stoppage to win the European Cruiserweight title against Dylan Brigon. And obviously Martin Bacoli caused a bit of thunder on the night. He had a very easy three, three round win against a guy whose name I'm not even going to try to say. Igor Shevashewski. There you go. 
You, just call you, him Hulk. Just call him okay. Hulk. That's what they call yeah. him. Yeah. So three round um, destruction there by Martin Bacoli. And obviously more, more talked about was his argument with Dillian White after the fight. Um, which has made people start talking. Does Bacoli now deserve a shot at, um, you know, honours at heavyweight? So, you know, we shall see. Um, I'm going to have to leave you a second very quickly, based to talk about the next fight, because I've got to go and get my power cord to plug my device in. I was okay. running long. What's the what next one we're talking about? Next? All right, let me talk about Moreau. You go get your power. Okay. All right, so um, real quick one, obviously, David Morell was a co-feature uh, against Yamaguchi Falcao. And basically, I don't really have to go through too much because it was another one-round job. But Yamaguchi just couldn't take the power, um, as you can kind of see there. Like, I don't even think Morell was even loading up that much compared to what he's we know he's capable of. But his punch placement is second to none. His power is very, is very, very dangerous. As you can see, he's got very long limbs. Like he can just catch you on the outside when you think you're out of range, but he's still right in front of you. The movement, everything, everything is there. Like his feet are never fully planted all the way, but he just generates mad power even while moving. As we probably see from this shot here, you'll see that even when he comes into the shot. His feet ain't even planted on the ground. Like, they come up off the ground. You see? Right there. There's no, you know, they're not on the ground building up traction and movement. It's it's all, it's just all motion. It's all seamless. Um, and he's definitely a very, a very dangerous cru uh, Cuban fighter. He's a hybrid between a Cuban fighter with all the fundamentals of a, of a natural-born Cuban, the ring IQ, footwork, movement, but just the like the vicious ferocity of like a Puerto Rican and a Mexican. Like he want, he goes for the kill and he wants you out of there by any means necessary. And the one thing I do like about what he done in this particular fight was when he had Yamaguchi hurt in the very first moment when he was wobbling around, he's motions to the ref, like ref, like look at him. He's not, he's not okay. Like you need to count him. And then the ref is saying, he's, oh, he's still on his feet. So, okay, you know what? I'm just going to put him down because I can't have what happened last time happen again. It's almost like he's he's thinking about, I just want to now, I don't want to just beat these guys up like I've been doing because I've seen what happens when I do that. So now it's just about you've got to go and you have to go early. So the beating is not going to be as severe. Um, and I just like everything about David Morell. Um there's an eye test that will have you say that he is one of the best natural talents in the division, but everyone knows I don't go specifically off of an eye test. However, what I will say is he's one of those people I might make an exception for with regards to the eye test. You've got two former Olympians that he's faced in his last two fights. And if you look at who he's fought in his first nine fights as a professional, most professional fighters aren't fighting that level of guy until maybe their 16th to 20th fight before they're getting ready to that next contender step before going to world level. So that is what maybe tells me that my eye test on this one is correct because at the level he should be at, as a 9-0 prospect realistically, even though he holds the regular version of the WBA title at 168, it tells you that he is ahead of his development. So, yes, he hasn't faced the best in the division yet, and far from it. So we're not going overboard, but this is one of the few eye tests that I would say, if someone said to me, no, nah, he's the goods, I'll, I'll believe it, because I've seen the level of guy he's been in there with at just 8-0, 9-0. Uh, that's my thoughts on it. Cool. So I'm pretty much in agreement with that. Um he definitely satisfies the eye test for me, as you said. Um, a very high caliber of fighter in his nine fights now. Um, certainly, um, you know, showed great power in this fight against Falcao. Um, technically, he, you know, obviously he's, he's, he's Cuban school, so he's, you know, his fundamentals are very good. 
Um, I think he has a playfulness about him. I think he, he he's one of these guys that he, he's always got a smile. You know, his interviews are very interesting to listen to because he's, you know, he's very humble when he talks on the mic. Um, but I think there's a playfulness about him that belies uh, a killer underneath. So even in this fight, I kind of looked at, the, you know, the, the, the sum total of the rounds which we saw and thought to myself, he's playing with this guy. You know, he jabs when he wants, he moves in a, a real graceful way. But then when he wants to put spite in, he knows how to do it well. Um, so, you know, he's he's definitely one that I, I'm, I'm looking forward to. But I think he's got a lot more to, to show. And I think when the, the harder fights do come along, I think you'll see a less playful type of approach to his, to his boxing, a less um, flamboyant style and a more hurtful, spiteful side of his character, which I can see is in there coming out to the fore. Fair enough. All right, so before we go to main event, let's talk quickly about this week's action um, with William Zapeda versus Jaime Abeleda. Um Can I just say very quickly, uh, oh, sorry. Yeah, I was just going to say, while we're on the undercard of um, Davis Garcia, quick mention, um, Beck versus Gabriel Rosado. Um, we saw the end of Gabriel Rosado. You know, he's now officially retired. He lost in a 10-round battle against uh, Bektomir Melikuziev. And you know what? I have had a great time watching this guy do work. He has been the gatekeeper for a number of years now, but I have to give him his props and say, salute, young man, on your journey ahead because, you know, you've given us a great deal of of of, uh, of memories, good memories in your, what was a very, what I can, what I would consider a very distinguished uh, career. He didn't duck anybody in his time. Well, he's definitely going to uh, probably be put onto the commentary team for the zone in the US or a part of the um, the presentation team because he's done that before. He's very good at that, and there's a lot, probably a lot more uh, films or TV in his in his uh, future. So yeah, big up to Gabe Rosado. Um, right, yeah. So back to William Zapeda versus Jaime Abeledo. Um Look, it was it was what. <laughs> Williams a pay that had to do essentially like he found he found the relevant shots he kept the pressure on Jaime Jaime is obviously a guy that was coming up from one three uh one three oh so he wasn't a natural lightweight either so the size difference was telling um I guess in the the shot selection and the punch power was probably more telling as well um look he was an overmatched opponent but I guess this is just Another one on the, uh, you know, on the on the trajectory to um, to Williams Apeda's championship contentions, and as we saw there, there was that was a very vicious body shot, and that was the third one that he took. So he got up twice, but on that third particular one, as you can see there, he's got hit twice with it. Uh, he he ducks out, gets hit again, and then gets hit once more right there. Like yeah, he took four of them flush. And that was the third time going down. And that's how you can really tell that he was stopped with a body shot. Um, now, I feel bad for William Zapata because this wasn't supposed to be a main event fight. This fight was actually supposed to be on the, um, the card the week before, um, you know, with Davis and Garcia. But it was um, it was moved to the to the main event of that card just due to obviously Virgil Ortiz and Imanta Stanionis fight being called off, um, which I was very much looking forward to. Um, so, yeah, the entire week was a bit deflating. It wasn't anything special. The entire card itself was very lackluster from the before the bell stuff all the way through to the main event. But William, that's not his fault. He did what he was supposed to do. He got the victory, dominant fashion, second round. Now it's time to step up to, um, you know, the top of the division. Like, uh, maybe not, we're not talking as the champions just yet, but you've now got to fight a top, a top 10, a top five guy. You know, you've got to try and you've got to call it an Isaac Cruz. 
Like you've got to call out um, a George Cambosis if he beats Maxi Hughes or even Maxi Hughes. Like you've whoever's in that top ten, that's who you've now got to be. You've got to be calling out. There's you know you can't do the what is it? You can't do the um, the Jaime Munguia path. You can't do the the initial Canelo path. Uh, you know, just all of these all fights against whoever, and then you sort of start stepping up in your 40th, 50th fight. Uh, there's no time for that. So, yeah, get a move on. Um, definitely can't do the... Um, what's his name? Um, got What's his name? Rodriguez? Yeah, can't do that one either. You know what um, Ubivol fought? Zerdo Ramirez, yeah, you can't do oh. the Ramirez, can't do the Ramirez thing either. Mm. Where you know okay. you can't be fighting bare, you know, bare unknowns, Pink and then fight. yeah. So we gotta gotta get a move on. But he did what he's supposed to do. Main thing. Anything to say about that? No, let's move on. Okay, so we'll take it now to the main event of the Showtime pay per view card last week. Um, Tony, as I know, this is your guy. Please. Do the honours and get us started. Here we go. So Tank Davis against Ryan Garcia. What uh, was billed as, you know, the, the 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 hype job fight where, you know, two guys have got loads of hype. Um, obviously, Tank giving away height. He's got five inches uh, off of um, off Ryan. Ryan is clearly a bigger guy. All the talk pre-fight was about the weight stipulations, you know, the catch weight um, limit, the rehydration clause. But at the end of the day, all of that meant nothing because they both did what they needed to do to get to the ring on time, on weight. And when the action took place, it was all about my guy, Javonta Tank Davis. Now, give credit to Ryan. You know, he did basically do everything to make this fight you know he called for it he 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 did whatever weight stipulations were asked of him and if you want to say that he put himself in a compromising position by doing so c'est la vie but he did what he was asked to do unfortunately for him he come across the tank davis who to me is a phenom in the lightweight division i've got to say you know um you know I know, base. You had this down as a potential Ryan win. There was no doubt in my mind that having seen Ryan get knocked down by Luke Campbell, that the much harder hitting um, Tank Davis was going to cause more of a problem. Obviously, you can see from that previous shot there that Ryan was timed by Tank. Tank knew what he was seeing. You know, Ryan came out with that blitz in the second round. He tried to force the action. But then he comes out and, you know, I've been seeing this in so many videos when you see Ryan. When he throws his hook, he drops his hand and his chin flies up in the air. And it was like, he does this all the time. So it was inevitable that with someone with immaculate timing like Tank would end up finding that, that shot. And that's what he did in the second round. Obviously, we move on now to the sixth round. And here you see... Um, Ryan, again, finding himself in a compromised position where he's letting his midriff open um, and Tank finds him with a beautiful left hook into the rib section and it's enough to send Ryan down. You can see it there. Um, and Ryan, after taking a delayed knee down, he wasn't able to get up. I know we're going to talk about whether he quit or whether he didn't. Um, the fact that he jumped out at 10, you know, that's that's uh, obviously going to be the, the talking point of this whole fight. Um, as far as I'm concerned, um, you know, look, I like Ryan. I think he's been a, uh, a shining light in the sport. He's definitely brought a lot of eyes to the sport. And considering that this uh, fight, is now the fifth or the sixth highest ranking pay-per-view fight of all time. This clearly shows that both guys have got star quality. Can I just um, say, can I just count, if it wasn't the highest pay-per-view, it was the fifth highest gate in Las Vegas. Okay. This Go clearly ahead. has, but 
does not the do not the the, the pay per view buys one point two also well, stack that up. They haven't they haven't been confirmed yet, but okay. that wouldn't make it the fifth highest. There's okay. there's been uh, four of there's been four million pay per views before and stuff. So there's okay. yeah, cool. Um, but yeah, you know, look, they both have star quality. This was definitely to me a case where, um, you know, you had to have the right dance partner in order to make this type of fight with the amount of attention drawn towards the fight itself. As you said, um, the, the gate was phenomenal. The pay-per-view numbers are, are staggering, um, apparently. Um, and so, you know, they walk away from this, this fight and they both have a good trajectory. Obviously, Ryan now has confirmed he will no longer be competing at lightweight. Good luck to him at um, junior welterweight. You know, again, a stack of great fights are there with some killers up at, up at that division. But if he can get, you know, good good names in the ring with him, we'll be seeing him in some high-numbered high um, pay-per-views again. I'm pretty sure of that. Tank, as far as I'm concerned, um, if you had any thoughts whether he was or not a, a superstar of the sport, as far as I'm concerned, he was a superstar before this. He definitely is a superstar now. Whether he does the big numbers like that again is to be seen. Obviously, it requires the right dance partner. But as far as I'm concerned, he's a star. He's a phenom in the sport. The only guy in the lightweight division, as far as I'm concerned, and it's purely subjective, that can see him and give him trouble is Shakur Stevenson because he is a consummate boxer. But other than that, Devin, Loma, anybody else can get the smoke. My guy, I'm backing him to take over the division. You done? <laughs> All right. Um, do I even really want to say much about the fight? Not particularly. I feel like we've said a lot already. Um, look, Ryan done. He done okay in the first round. He did what he was supposed to do, which was keep it long, keep Tank behind the jab, and make Tank have to come to him because ultimately Tank doesn't like to fight on the front foot. He likes to fight on the back foot. He likes the he likes the counter punch. He likes to set you up into positions that you're not at your advantage, you're not at your sort of strongest moment, and then obviously counter and make you pay. Um, Ryan took all of that away from him in the first round, but in the second round, as we see here, like he got greedy. He repeated the same pattern three times, which is what we already know as anyone who's ever tried to throw the same punch at Tank three times in a row has ended up on the floor afterwards because. Once he reads the pattern after the second one, he knows exactly what he's going to do after the third. Now, the fact it takes him three times to, to, to decide that he's going to make the move can potentially be a downfall against better opponents, especially if they're able to disguise the shots a little bit better. Because obviously it took him three attempts uh, for Leo Santa Cruz, took him three attempts against Roley, and then the three attempts. I think there was even the case with the Hector Luis Garcia. It was a similar thing. Like, if you do the same move, you spam the same move over and over. It's just like when you play in a fighting game. Most of the time, whenever you do that and you keep doing that, the computer learns what you're going to do and it counters you. And that's the same in pretty much every game that you play. So Tank's brain working like a computer. Okay, you've done that. Okay, you just did it again. Oh, okay, well, now you're doing it again. Hold that bang and that's basically what happened um and then yeah from there he basically that one shot i feel like just took all of the fight out of ryan and then everything after that was almost like it was a hit and hope it was a hope and a prayer um and even though he, he did some good work in the fifth round it just it, none of it ever looked like oh now he's about to take over this fight it just looked like oh he's having he's having a good moment here Tank, just don't do anything stupid and you'll be all right. And ultimately, that's basically what happened. Um, now, yeah, prior to the fight, I did say I, I see I've got to see Ryan winning this because he's called for the fight for 
almost three years. Like there's something has he has to see something that we don't see that why he's been begging for this fight. But clearly it was more on the Anthony Yard thing than anything else. It's to skip steps. You've got you've got a name, you've got a following, and you use that to your advantage to skip the necessary steps that you need to get yourself ready for you know the guys at the top of the division or the guys with the better IQ or whatever. And yeah, he chose to skip steps and didn't uh, it didn't work for him basically. So um, also you say that you know he's officially no longer a a, a lightweight well let's be honest he hasn't been a lightweight for nearly two years um <laughs> even if this fight being a catch rate at 136 it can't be a lightweight fight <laughs> it just it, it otherwise it would be a catch rate within the lightweight limit um but yeah that all that all aside it was what it was it was a very lackluster performance javante davis basically just he just showed that whether he, whether people say that he's elite or not, which the jury is still out because he hasn't faced the elite yet, but he was still two to three levels above Ryan Garcia, and that's just a damning indictment, plain and simple. So, um, you say he's that's a, a superstar. Scathing. That's a bit scathing now to say that he hasn't faced any elite. Or to... I said he hasn't faced the elite of the division. That's what I said. Okay, now, is, okay. is that a lie? Is that like okay? Oh no, I'll give you that. Give okay, you that. which is what I said was I don't know if I can say he's elite because he hasn't faced the elite of that division, but he's shown that he's two to three levels above Ryan Garcia, which is a damning indictment for Ryan and where he thought he was. That's that's the point I was making. Now can I ask a question? In in your summation, saying that he's not elite, because I'm gonna be honest, I think he's elite. I didn't say he's not, I said I don't know. If he's elite, because I haven't seen him okay, against but, the other elites in the division. Okay, he you haven't seen him against the elites in the lightweight division, but you have uh -huh. seen him against elite fighters in other divisions. Name only Neil one. Santa Cruz. No. Pedraza, uh, I'll tell you. No, no, no. Um, Pedraza. Pitbull. Him and Pedraza is is the is the legit credible win. We we have that hundred percent. Okay. Hector, hold on. Hector Luis Garcia, very yeah. good, very credible. Mm -hmm. Obviously, he done what he done against Chris Colbert. However, he brought him up from one thirty to one thirty five. Leo Santa Cruz, who who was at his best at super bantamweight, brought him up to one hundred and thirty. So he hasn't faced any guy that you would call quote unquote elite at their natural weight. So I can't say that he's that basically he's better than them or he's like. He's elite for facing a guy that okay. you bring up. Oh, okay, let me counter that argument. Go ahead. You don't need to be at the same weight as somebody else to be considered elite. Let me give you the example. Canelo, Al um, Canelo Alvarez is an elite fighter. Yeah? Now, we're not going to dis dis discount Dimitri Bivol's performance against Canelo Alvarez and say, oh, Canelo um, Bivol isn't elite because, oh, he only faced a guy that came up a weight. No, Canelo Alvarez is an elite fighter. If Bivol out, out boxes an elite boxer, despite the fact that he's had to come up, we now have on our hands an elite boxer beater. So he himself must be elite. No, so it doesn't work that way. I understand how you cannot give crap tank his credence as an elite fighter when he's fought an elite fighter and beat him soundly. Which is only Pedraza. Santa at the time. Cruz? Santa, Santa Cruz wasn't elite when he fought him. What? Santa look Cruz at, being an elite look at fighter. Santa Cruz, look at Santa Cruz's record up until the point Tank fought him. His last credible win was the Carl Frampton win. Is, he, is Leo Santa Cruz going before his fight with with Tank Davis, an elite fighter. Not before then, but the prior to yeah. that, when did he was at did, one, when he was at one twenty two, yeah. When he was no, when he was at one twenty two, he was yeah. an elite. He was elite within that division. At one twenty six, he was. You could say he was world class. At one thirty, done absolutely nothing, and then went subsequently tried to go back down to one twenty six and sort of slitted in between. 
but we remember we have to look at things that where where someone is when you fight them right okay. now if we look at if if you're going to bring the canelo alvarez analogy well we've already seen that within the lightweight division dimitri bivol has had already beat a bunch of the the who's who's from the last generation he had mm -hmm. he beat jean pascal who then came on to beat fang long men so you think, oh, well, it's not like, oh, he's faded because he still went and beat one of the top the top prospects out there afterwards. After mm -hmm. beating Canelo, who, which, let's be honest, one of the biggest factors of the fact that he beat Canelo was because he was just too big for him. We can't discount that. It's not like, oh, it was just a couple pounds. No, like physically he was able to take the shots better because the, the power didn't travel the same. He had, yes, he's an elite boxer, he has an elite brain, but ultimately the size helped him a lot, being that naturally bigger guy. The way that we then tell that he is elite is by the way he then dismantled Zerdo Ramirez, who, while not being elite, was a much bigger guy than him. So mm. if the smaller guy goes up and beats the bigger guy, that gives you more credence to say that that person is highly skilled or that person is elite as opposed to the bigger guy beating the smaller guy that comes up. That's why I can't wholeheartedly give Tank full credit for those fights if you're dragging people up from weight classes below and beating them. Yes, you're beating good guys, but you're the naturally bigger guy at that moment. And um, with, as again, with regards to Bivol and Ramirez, Bivol, uh, Ramirez has never been an elite guy, but he was a former world champion at 168. He's a very big guy at one at 175. Came in the ring over 200 pounds. Bivol was in the ring at about 180, 185, give or take. And Bivol dismantled him, took everything away from him and just soundly beat him. So that is the mark of an elite fighter, negating the size advantage of someone else. So that's why I don't give Tank the same credit that you would like me to, but I'm not saying he's not there. All I'm saying is I want to see it against mm -hmm. the guys that we claim are the best. Because no one, none of us ever claimed that Ryan was the best at 135 or even 140. He was just, he was like the face. He was, yeah. he was that guy. And with regards to you saying Tank is a superstar, I would rein that in at the moment, but he's a star. 100% he's a star. I don't know about superstar and I won't know until the next fight now. Okay. What the next fight does, what the fight after that does, that to me will tell me if he's if he is a superstar. But what I would actually call him, more so than a star or a superstar, similar to Ryan to a degree, but more so for Tank, I'd call him a special attraction fighter. That's okay. what I, he's to me because he, he doesn't necessarily take on the champions, but he is someone that garners interest. And yeah. So if you look at WWE, like. When Jake uh, Logan Paul is in WWE, he's a special attraction because mm. he's not fighting the best. Or he's not fighting like the guy or he's not going to win the belt, whatever. But mm. he brings eyes to the division. A bit like mm -hmm. Jake Paul. He's in his own world, but yeah. he's a special attraction. You go to watch him. So mm -hmm. that's I think that's the realm that I'm putting Tank in until such a time as I get a Shakur or a Devin or even a Loma. But to be fair, the winner... And loser of Haney Loma kind of drops out of the conversation. Because if Loma loses, there's no more value in Tank beating him, to be honest, mm. in my opinion. And I if Devin that. loses, he's going to go up to 140. So you might face him up there after in a year or two, maybe. But then that only leaves you with three credible guys. Maybe the, the Isaac Cruz rematch to clean that up, if you want to say that. Mm. Williams are paid off. Shakur Stevenson. And then obviously Frank Martin as well. Um, and those that you got those four, yeah. yeah. You take out you take out two or three of those four, then you've got a shout. But also, if you look at Tank's resume, and we're gonna we're getting off on a bit of a tangent, but because you brought it there, I like where we're going with it. If you look at basically everyone who he fights, with the exception of six fights in his entire career, every single person is Hispanic, right? So they they do the, it's the Mayweather formula. You you go against the guys, you know, Mexicans, um, Puerto Ricans, yes, Dominicans, yeah. whatever, and you mm. trade off this last name and you make people get behind them because of because their Hispanic background. So that is one thing that then tells me more so that the guys like Devin and Loma and Haney and Martin probably don't get the shot because they don't fit the profile and the demographic that they're looking for. But we'll see moving forward. Um, 
with regards to the other part, which obviously you alluded to a little bit earlier, um, Ryan got hit with the, the body shot, hit the rib. Um, some people say it might have grazed the liver as well, or a combination of both. The laid reaction goes down. There was a lot of talk earlier on about did he quit or um, did he not? I want to show you something. I'm going to put something on the screen, which I think will um, fully dispel all of that talk. Uh, let me see if I can find it. Uh, if I can actually get it on here. Um, oh, I might not be able to do it from, from the phone. Uh, oh, wait. Uh, Right, what I'm going to do, I'm going to add it in. Um, you can chat for a moment just while I add this to the... Uh... Yeah, so, um, you know, look, people's uh, accreditation for Tank Davis is going to be varied. It's very subjective based on, you know, who you like. Obviously, it's the same kind of thing uh, you, you could hear clearly in... Tonight's Monday Night Smoke with people saying, well, Dan Aziz beats Boatsy or Boatsy beats Yard or Yard beats both of them. And, you know, all of those kind of things are very subjective until such time as we actually see those fights made. Um, where Tank goes now is the crux of the matter because he, in my opinion, no longer can be dealing with... Um, you know the 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 B the B grade fighters. You know he's he's put himself in a blockbuster situation with Ryan. He now needs to be continuing a trend of being a dominant champion, and he needs to get a belt for a start. He needs to get a belt, and he needs to show that he can be a dominant champion in a weight and not a Reggie belt. Um, so obviously that does mean he needs to be facing the winner of Loma versus Haney. If the belts do end up getting um, um, put out there, if Haney goes up, then he needs to be grabbing as many of those belts as he possibly can as soon as he can. And he needs to be showing that he can um, clean up a vision. He needs to be um, a takeover type scenario where he becomes the undisputed. And, Obviously, the fight that I would love to see, because, you know, the fight that I'm desperate to go see if they make it is Spence against Crawford, if that gets made in the next two weeks, as they, as apparently is going to be announced. I will be in Las Vegas on July 22nd to see that. But lo and behold, if Tank and Shakur should make a fight together, I would probably be looking to also attend that fight, because that, to me would be one of the most exciting fights in boxing. Give no doubt. So um, it's it, it, it's good to see that, um, you know, Tank is, is, is being to the promised land, so to speak. Um, let's just get the straps and let's get this big fight on between him and Shakur. Because in my opinion, those two guys will be the last men standing when all the dust has settled in the lightweight division. As far as um, the rest of that show is concerned, um, let me see if there's anything else I wanted to talk about. Hold on. Before you do that, okay. let me just play. I'm going to play this. Um, mm -hmm. And then we'll basically, this just addresses the whole did he quit? Did he not quit? Uh, scenario. Did it hit that rip part at all, Ryan? Yeah, yeah. I knew it. And I didn't want to continue because my rib. No, no, listen. But it's okay. Right. So the, the words are right there, plain and simple to anyone who had queries, and I didn't want to continue because of my rib. No, I couldn't continue. I didn't want to. That's a, that's a submission right there. That's, that's an admission of submission. Clear as day, he didn't want to go on. Now, I don't fault him for that. I don't think any fighter has to die in the ring for, for my satisfaction to, to show their heart as such. But what it does then obviously show you is how much they're willing, I mean, I guess how mentally strong they are like in general 
if this be, if this is just a one off, it is what it is. He he made a smart choice for a better day. If it becomes like repeat behavior or a pattern of behavior, then people can maybe look to say he just doesn't have it for that top level or he's an on top fighter. When it's going good, he's fine. But when he's in a crisis, there's an issue. But at this precise moment, to me, it was just a guy who had, again, as I said before, loads of built in excuses already and people who would already taint the victory that Tank was going to have just due to all the stuff that happens before. He saw an opportunity to get out of a situation that he knew at that time was a no win. And he done that. Um, and again, I don't have any particular issue with it myself. The only issue I have is when people try to rewrite the history or try to lie and say, well, no, he didn't quit or it's not a quit or will you take a body shot and see how you like it? I'm not a professional boxer. I didn't sign up for that. <laughs> like you've signed up for that career. You know what happens. You know what it entails and you know what people say. So that's a, that's a choice that you have to live with in life. But I'm only caring about the definition of words. That's me. I'm very much like that. I'm a stickler for words. So by the definition of like dictionary, that's what a quit is when you choose to no longer continue something or when you leave. <laughs> and that's what okay. he done. He left that fight. All right. So I'm going to counter you now. So I'm going to play devil's advocate in that I want to give Ryan a little bit of a glimmer of hope to say I'm not a quitter. And what I'm going to say is this. Clearly, he was hurt to the ribs in training because the guy came out and he said publicly on camera in front of the world, I hurt Ryan to the ribs. Now, the whole mole scenario that we heard about, that's BS because ultimately you don't have to go far to find out if somebody gets dropped in training. You don't have to go far to find out if somebody's got a sweet spot that they can get hurt to. You know, you don't have to send moles to find that kind of information out. Exchanges of conversations happen between gym mates in gyms all the time. Yeah. I'll go to somebody else's gym. I'll do some sparring with somebody else. I see something out the corner of my eye. Oh, just saw what's his name get dropped. All right. I'm not going to tell the world. But, you know, certain one or two men might get to know. And if, for instance, I happen to be in a situation where I'm talking to somebody who's fighting that person I saw get dropped, then guess what? I might pass that information. I didn't see that man get dropped with a left hook. C'est la vie. These things happen in the game of boxing all the time. To me, Ryan had some kind of issue prior to coming into this fight, but that's every boxer. Every boxer has ailments. Right now, I got a bunged up shoulder. I did have a, a torn rotator cuff. It's kind of healed, but it's a bit bungy. Yeah, but that doesn't stop me. Yeah. And I've got this on my wrist right now, protecting a little bit of a sore wrist. So, you know, hey, we're fighters. We're going to get bangs. We're going to get, you know, damage is going to happen in training. That's the life of a fighter. I don't think there's such a thing as a guy walking in the ring and I've got nothing hurting. It's nigh on impossible. Have I been concussed in my life? I, I must have been concussed a thousand times. Because I happily spar with heavyweights. And sometimes they clock me and like that little half second dizziness. Ping! What the f***? You just lace me. And it's like, mm, all right, let me take a little 30 second there. Because you just laced me in the top of my head. And I, and I was buzzed. And that's concussion. Mild concussion be it. But it's concussion nonetheless. And I have to be careful that I don't take too many of them shots. But my point is, this is the fight game. You're going to get hurt. So maybe a little birdie did tell Tank that, you know, soft at the ribs, or he did get touched at the ribs and something happened. But Tank fights that way anyway. He's a vicious body puncher. So even if nobody had told him, he would have still searched for that shot. And let's not forget, he got dropped with a chin shot smack on the chin 
So if he didn't get taken down with the body shot, he was going to get knocked out either way, as far as I'm concerned. So this whole, you know, well, I was hurt by somebody else. He, 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 he didn't use it as an excuse, but I'm saying, you know what? He might have been uh, compromised because he might have had a, a shot at the rib that was a little bit sore and Tank re-enabled it. And it was like, okay, you know what? Boom. I was, you know, that shot that hit me in the rib that I went down to in, in sparring, that came again and <sighs> couldn't get up. That body shot there, that floating rib shot, is a 10-second killer. Um, I was going to Tony, before you carry on, you, mm. you said that you was going, you was playing devil's advocate and as to why he's not a quitter, but you haven't said anything to dispel anything that I said previous. As I said, he might have been carrying something, uh -huh. yeah, as a as as a pr a prior injury injury going into the ring, yeah. Tank Tank took advantage of the situation, uh -huh. knocked him down with the with the accurate shot to the rib cage, yeah. He goes down. And as I said, that shot is a 10-second killer. Mm -hmm. Now, bear in mind... 10 seconds, boom, he's up. If mm. you get that shot... Let me say, no, let me, let me break it down. If you get that shot, generally you're down for between 9 and 13 seconds. And at, at 13 seconds, you can fight again. You could fight again at 13 seconds. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we've seen it. We know we've seen plenty of guys who've managed to suck it up and ride out another couple of seconds and get themselves back into a fight because that's a 9 to 13 second punch. You will drop you and it will give, get you out of the way. You, could, you might not beat the count because you might be down for 13 seconds. But at 13 seconds, you're going to be all right again. You're going to be like, oh, man, I couldn't get up at 10, but I could have got up at 13. And the fact that so, he jumped up at 10, yeah, uh, yeah, tells me, all right, it was obviously 10 seconds. It wasn't 13. It could have been nine seconds and you could have got up at nine and maybe just, but he couldn't. At the same time, yeah, you might be right. He might have gone, you know what, as the words came out of his mouth, he got me that shot, boom, I couldn't continue. But I just No, 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 say, no, 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 I couldn't. I didn't want to. That's what he said. Want. I didn't want to continue. Okay, okay. He says he didn't want to. He probably um, was half and half in terms of like, okay, the shot kept me down, but at the same time, I was halfway re retired out of this fight anyway. Mm -hmm. Can I just say, uh, first, like, the, the, the retort that you gave almost wasn't even necessary because I didn't actually call him a quitter. I still haven't. Up to this okay. point, I've said just by the definition of the word, he quit. But I actually think he was right to do so. But the, the only issue is patterns of behavior. If it happens again and again, if, then we know that, okay, when it comes yeah. to being able to buy it down, that's just not you or your body is just not built for this. Yeah. But my what I've said previous, I've said it on a couple other channels. I'm going to say it here so everyone can hear it before we get going because we've already been on it longer than I think we want it to be. He could have prevented all that did he quit, did he not quit talk by just staying on the floor for another couple of seconds. That's all he had to do. If he, if he stayed on the floor for 11 seconds or 12 seconds or even when the ref, you know the ref normally um, puts yeah. the arm around you and waves it off. Mm. Stay down there, look up, maybe take a breath, and then get up. Mm. Like all of that tells that says to people, right? Yeah, he couldn't get up because Luke Campbell didn't just get up at ten. Like when yeah. he got put down with, it, and people knew he was hurt, he couldn't get up. So yeah. he took twelve seconds before he got up, thirteen seconds, which told you, yeah, I couldn't get up at that point. But you getting yeah. up right at the point of ten, that's what has caused all the problem. So that's why you now have to probably live with the did he quit? Did he not quit? You could have mm. cut all of that out if you would have, if you was if it was that case, and you were literally, yeah, I, I can't go on, or this is only going to go one way, like I'm done. Then be smarter in that moment. That's all I would say, because that avoids everything else. Yeah, yeah, I get you, I get you. But yeah, 
Anyway, look, that's that's old news. I doubt people have still got the same the same opinions on it that they had last week. Um, but we wanted to bring out the show, make sure everyone saw, you know, that we're still we're still here, we're still doing what we're supposed to be doing. Um, look, ultimately next week will be will be proper <laughs> the, the the regular regular scenario. This is a bit of a special occasion for Tony specifically because his team are going to be playing in about an hour uh, by the time you guys watch this. <laughs> And um, yeah, they better win because I, I actually bet on them. So uh. all right, but yes, um, right. What we're gonna do as as normal, we're gonna put the the ticker tapes down. Uh, as you can see, that's all the Tony stuff. Put uh, tell them where they can find you, Tony. So you can find me by looking up Pugilist Boy on YouTube and Twitter, but you can find me on Instagram by looking up Pugilistic Boy. Pugilistic Boy on instagram and instagram is the platform i use the most and all the spellings are there for everyone who you know has an issue with spelling you can see it right there so there shouldn't be any issues for that uh and myself look base the kid the hardcore casual you can just type in base the kid and please spell it right because this is it's crazy how many people spell it incorrectly like it's right there it's right in front of you it's b-a-s-e-d-a-k-i-d capital kid as well because it stands for something um but yeah uh you find me there on on youtube um instagram's based a kid but i don't use instagram really for the boxing stuff unless it's in my stories so don't go there looking for boxing takes go to the youtube go to the twitter which is b underscore a underscore s underscore e or you can just type in base the kid and it pops up um so yeah and yeah, thank you lot very much for for watching this longer than expected episode. But it's uh it's been good. It's been therapeutic. We got two weeks out of the way. Now we're just going to be looking forward to next week. So, Tony, you got any last words before we sign up? No. Nope. Thank you very much to everyone who's joined in and watched in. If you leave any comments, um, because obviously we don't have a live, but if you leave any comments, base and I do look at comments after the time. So if you've got anything to say, we will um, pick that up and we may respond in the comments as replies. All right. Good stuff. So, right, ladies and gentlemen, enjoy the football and we will catch you next time. Peace. Salute.